I want to start by just offering an apology and explaining a little of where I've been and why and- Doggy! Doggy! You didn't think I was serious, did you, Doggy? I bet you did. You know why? Do you know why? Do you know why? Because you are a dumb doggy. You dumb doggy. I missed you, doggy. Doggy! Come here, come here, doggy, come here, do Whatever the title of this video is, it's probably a lie. I had to make a splash, back on my break the internet grind, back on my rat race, back on my doggy race, break the internet, it's a lie, but also not a lie. What I'm thinking right now is the t for the title, non-fiction books that changed my life. And maybe it's not a lie, it's a half lie. I've been reading a lot of nonfiction lately. It's pretty much all I've been reading. I have been obsessed with, with facts, with cold, hard facts, data, numbers, dates. I've never been interested in history until now, and now I, I can't get enough. I've, some, occasionally, I've been interested in facts. And a lot of these books, a lot, it's... I don't know, like eight books, we'll speed through. I promise doggy, I promise doggy, I promise doggy. About half of these books are fantastic. Some of them, nonfiction is pretty hit or miss for me. Um, a note on nonfiction, do I'm gonna have to cut that bit. That was completely irrelevant and I'm trying to be precious about my time, what I talk about. But it's a partial lie because for a book to change your life, you need time to see. If I had read these books, one of them in particular, years ago, I would be confident in saying they changed my life. But for a book to change your life, it takes time. And I've read all of these books this year and in the past, in the past month, two, three, this year. Let's talk about the books. The first book, Born to be Posthumous by Mark Derry. This is a biography of Edward Gorey, an artist who I love. And I didn't know this book existed until I saw it at a bookstore and I was like, the hell? If you don't know who Edward Gorey is, you probably know the work of people he heavily inspired. Those being Lemony Snicket, the guy who wrote a series of unfortunate events, and Neil Gaiman, Coraline. Most of his work is tiny books. And then he did illustrations for a lot of books. There's an edition of Dracula, that your Barnes & Noble probably definitely carries. It's like red, big, and Edward Gorey did illustrations for that. Anyway, my understanding is that he pioneered, pioneered, I don't know, I'm sh maybe someone did it before, but he kind of brought into the mainstream a mixing of genres. Gorey wrote children's books that publishers did not want to market to children because they were so gory. The book talks about nominal determinism, Edward Gorey, is not a pseudonym. It's his real name, Gorey. I grew up with the Gashley Crumb Tinies, which is an A to Z book about how children die. It's like A is for Amy who fell down the stairs, B is for Bobby who... But Edward Gorey is known for pioneering uh, the genre bending of like form and content that heavily inspired Lemony Snicket, Coraline, stuff like that. The biographies of R are on page 60, or chapter 2, is very interesting. I, you know, they say don't meet your heroes, and for a lot of the time, that's very, for good reason. They say that for good reason. I'm always wary of, like, listening to author talks for books I like, or, I don't know, just engaging with the artist beyond their published put out medium but not the case with gory i i think he's fantastic and i'm really enjoying the biography so far if you don't know who edward gory is you need to do some research because he's great oh also inspired tim burton people called him the grandfather of goth and i think that he didn't like that nickname but he's just like you know like if you like tim burton neil gaiman lemony snicket You'd be a dumb doggy not to like Edward Gorey. The next book I'm reading is Empire of Pain, 
And it is so good, so good. It's about the Sackler family and the drug empire. Particularly, I think the downfall was because of OxyContin, but one of the ancestors with the ancestors like one generation older than those responsible for OxyContin were responsible for why Valium became so big. Very, very fascinating and super well written. It reads like a thriller, great pacing. I have absolutely no notes. I've been meaning to read one of Patrick Radden Keefe, the author, other books say nothing since it came out and at the time I was really interested in it because I was in a big nonfiction cake and I was like raw it sounds really good swung out of that deep into fiction and at a point I almost donated like a lot of my nonfiction books I bought a bunch read a couple didn't read most of them and then swung into fiction and I was like, you know, I don't, I don't think I'm ever going to have a non-fiction phase, but here we are. And I still haven't read Say Nothing, but I, I have been getting to other books that I've had for a second. Empire of Pain is fantastic. I love, I love a scoop. And it's really good. Um, it also, we'll skip ahead to a, another book because it connects into it. I have a is Hidden Valley Road, which I bought as soon as it came out in paperback. I don't know when that was. It's I've had this book for years, and I thought it would be one of my favorite books, or very high up. It was not. It was not very good. It vacillated between extreme science, like extreme technical whatever, and like pulling on the heartstrings, emotional... anecdote and I was like mm. I was just bored by the end I don't I don't think I even finished this I think I got like 90% of the way through and I was like you know I just I don't need it anymore it I mean it is sad it's very sad it's about a family of like 12 kids 11 kids a lot of them 12 and more than half of them I think six of ten boys and the girls are the two youngest it doesn't matter but six of them have schizo... I listened and read along audiobook. I don't... I now do not know if it's pronounced schizophrenia or schizophrenia. But six of them have schizophrenia. And it's kind of part history of mental illness and part just like about the family. And I found the more technical aspects of the book the most interesting, but I just kind of got bored of the anecdote parts. A lot of the anecdotes are pretty irrelevant to the development of the treatment of schizophrenia and of them as subjects themselves. Oh, at one point they're talking about one of the daughters who does not have schizophrenia's PTSD and therapy. I'm looking at a notes app that I wrote. I use, occasionally I'll keep a notes app if I have anything to say for a book. And I don't know, I was just like, how did we get here? I, I understand that it's the effects of living with a family with schizophrenia, but it's not really about the development of schizophrenia or how the mental illness manifested itself in the boys. It was just kind of like the aftermath of living with such a horrible disease. And I was just like, it's not, you know, I don't unnecessary. Oh, at one point, a scientist is going to the house where they are. And the book, one of the like only quotes that I highlighted was, it says, um, Hidden Valley Road is where the family lived, which is just happens to be a banger title too for a book. But the quote says, as she walked through the door of the house on Hidden Valley Road, she couldn't help but recognize a perfect sample. This could be the most mentally ill family in America. <laughs> there were like a couple funny bits like that throughout the book, but I don't think they were, I don't think the author was like in on the prank. A priest molests a lot of the children. Ugh. The book is too much of a mix. It's like taking the marketability of this family of half of 
12 children having schizophrenia and then just tricking you into reading about the history of schizophrenia. And the irony is that I don't particularly care about the family, the hook. I was more interested in the history of the mental illness. I don't know. I also learned the word schizophrenogenic mother, which is a scientific term that was popular in the 60s and 70s maybe for a mother who causes schizophrenia in her children. I don't know why we have done away with that term. But the tie-in between the two books, Empire of Pain and Hidden Valley Road, deals with mental illness and this split in the mental illness camp, particularly schizophrenia, of is the disease nature or do schizophrenogenic mothers really exist, aka can mothers in their overbearing or cold and hands-off approach cause schizophrenia in their children? I'm in the latter camp, but the original patriarch of the Sackler family believed sort of the opposite, that it was genetic and that you needed drugs. Empire of Pain is also fascinating because of the marketing aspect. Listen, I don't, I don't, know. I don't know where we are, but I said at one point that it, the irony is that the hook is the most boring part of this book. I don't know. I just got bored of the family anecdotes. Like it opens with that the father and mother, who are not schizophrenic, like to train hawks, and to train a hawk, you have to sew its eyelids shut and leave it on your arm so that it becomes dependent on you. And I was like, what am I doing here? Why am I reading about these freaks? Sorry if you, I mean, that's like the way to, there was too much that was superfluous to the development of schizophrenia historically and the family's involvement. And that's all I'll say. I don't, I don't really recommend it unless you're super, I don't know, unless you want to. The next book I'm in the middle is, the next book I'm in the middle of is The Kingdom of Prep, the inside story of the rise and near fall of J. Crew. I'm about halfway through and it's pretty enjoyable. If you like, I mean, J. Crew, give it a read. But also, I, I like the arc of something staying relevant through change. I think that's an interesting concept per se. Staying relevant more so like, I don't know, how do you evolve and still be yourself? And I think that's fun. But similar to Empire of Pain, I find the marketing aspect of a brand, a company, very fascinating, really good. It's just fun. I, I can't get enough of facts. I don't really even care what it's about. If you have recommendations, hit me up. I've been looking at my local Barnes & Noble table for recommendations so far. I would say my interest in nonfiction is non is nonfiction, wing journalism, wing science, wing mm, je ne sais quoi. More on Kingdom of Prep maybe later. The best book, the one that I really think had I read years ago would have changed my life, not exaggerating, is Moonwalking with Einstein by Joshua Fowler. One of my teachers mentioned this in class years ago, and I was like, that sounds pretty interesting. And so I bought it off eBay. It looks, it's a defunct library copy. Didn't read it for years. I've had it for years. And I was like, maybe it's time to donate this book. And then I was like, no, I'll give it a shot. And it was amazing. Moonwalking with Einstein is part memoir, part journalism, part how-to, and part science psychology. It's well-written, easy to read, fun. Joshua Foer is a journalist who gets involved with the art and science of remembering by reporting on it. And then he's like, the people he's reporting are like, you could do this, do it. And so he does, and that's where it swings from just pure journalism to memoir. He wins the US Memory Championship. Um, moonwalking. <laughs> Honestly, I just thought it was fascinating. I don't, we can't do a deep dive into, but it's about the science of remembering and how our, and how society today, in today's day and age, does not value 
remembering, but why you should. Oh, did I say when I said whatever, did I say it was a partial how-to? If you memorize speeches or anything, the method of the memory palace is very useful. And what I thought the mem- uh, what I thought a memory palace was before I read it was like a completely fictional palace that you build in your mind from scratch, but it's not. It's taking places that exist in your mind, your childhood home, your high school, a neighborhood, a museum, whatever, whatever area you have a good spatial visual understanding of, and then putting images throughout it in your head so that you can walk back through it, look at the images, and easily recall what you were supposed to. And it's fascinating. I actually bought, it's back there, I'm not getting it, a book called The Seven Sins of Memory, I think, after I finished this, I was like, I, I gotta know more. I gotta know more. Oh my god! I also thought this was fascinating because it talks about methods of remembering that I... <laughs> that I used before I knew, you dumb doggy. <laughs> before I'd read the book, I was like, oh. I'm not special. I'm always surprised at how not unique and how not special I am. How everything I thought, whatever has been thought by someone else, I'm always humbled, surprised, and comforted by that. But I, for learning language, I would use a lot of these methods, or just one of them. <laughs> really, really good. I think it should be required curriculum for high school students. Or if, if the university, universities do like freshman reading experiences, I think they should just do moonwalking with Einstein every year. Short, enjoyable, and you learn something. Remembering is, is really is an art that ought not to have been kicked to the curb. It's like a relic. <laughs> it's also inspiring a little bit. I'm, I love an inspiring book. I love an inspiring story. I don't know. Can't, fi can't find a great quote that's kind of encapsulates what Moonwalking with Einstein is, but one last thought that I found exciting, cool, that does encapsulate the book is that memory, effective memory, is based on visual images. And I thought that was really cool. The first book I read this year, I think, is The Trial of Lizzie Borden. I bought this at Ollie's Outlet. Do you guys know what Ollie's Outlet is? For $4.99. On a whim, I was like, why did I buy this? I was feeling frisky. I mean, you have to be feeling frisky if you're shopping at Ollie's Outlet, but, and I was, and I was. The Trial of Lizzie Borden was fantastic. It is divided into two parts, I want to say, or in, I'm, in my mind it is. The first part, quick recap of the incident. Uh, if you don't know who Lizzie Borden is, she axed her parents down, allegedly, in 1891, I want to say. Who knows? Brutal. Killed them with an axe. Lots of hits. I think a character in Gotham, the TV show, is based off of Lizzie Borden. You know? You know that I missed you guys because when I read this and I wasn't, wasn't really popping out videos, anytime there was a blip in conversation with my friends, family, acquaintances, anyone, I would be like, have you heard of Lizzie Borden? And they'd be like, what? I, Lizzie Borden? Have you heard of her? And some of them would be like, yeah. Others would be like, no. My dad was like, Lizzie Gordon? And regardless of the answer, I would proceed to lecture them on how fascinating the trial was. I was like a dumb doggy frothing at the mouth, itching to tell people all about Lizzie Borden. And, and no one cared. And I knew they didn't care, but I had to get it off my chest. Told them all about Lizzie Borden. I'm not really a true crime junkie. I recently read the foreword to, I don't know, it was a book I wanted to read forever, like most nonfiction books that I've seen. It was uh, I'll Be Gone in the Dark, I want to say, and Gillian Flynn writes the intro. It's a beautifully written or well thought out intro. And it's like the premise of true crime is that you're getting off to someone else's trauma. And that's where it becomes tricky. And it, part of why I don't, I don't, I don't like true crime. Not just because I'm like up on my damn high horse, which 
I am, you dumb doggy. But also because it's just like, okay, that's tragic and. And the and, this book does the and. It's like quick, quick recall. And then it's, the book is about the tr trial. A lawyer wrote this. And I like some books on law because I find that filtering of fact and events fascinating. I mean, fiction is similar in that they're both storytelling and you choose how facts are presented, how you want them to come across. And I find that fascinating. I find it fascinating. So I had a really, really great time. If you're at all interested in law, in courts, I highly recommend The Trial of Lizzie Borden. She allegedly went to buy arsenic. I don't remember if it was arsenic. It was some poison days before she axed them down, allegedly. And that evidence ends up being excluded in court, which is crazy, which is crazy. This book also ties into another book I read. I love a little connection. Most of the books I read overlap in ways with each other, and I think that's really cool. Going into this, I didn't know if Lizzie Borden was guilty or not, so I'm not gonna tell you if she's found guilty or not. There was a jump scare on page 16 of this book. It shows the picture of the ax down father. I was reading this at night and I was like, that is spooky. Do you see that? His face is caved in. And on the next page, Lizzie Borden's stepmother, her father's second wife. There's also a picture of her laying face down dead. I looked on it was either Amazon or Goodreads. It was a fly. I thought it was inside my place. It's not. Close call. But someone was like, one star. And then they proceeded to list like 20 extremely minor discrepancies that they believe were discrepancies between actuality and how this book presented them. And I was like, calm down. It was a great book. It was a great book. Coming in. Not at last place, I'll save the worst for last, but not not too hot is The Devil in the White City by Eric Larson. Eric Larson was an author who, in my mind's eye, I kind of grouped with Patrick Radden Keefe in that they're like sensationalizing per se facts. I don't know if Eric, Patrick Radden Keefe just had better subject matter, but that book is way better than The Devil in the White City was. By the time this book finished, I was like, Ugh. Come on, I'm ready, I'm ready to go. It was boring, it was, it was not very good. Devil in the White City is about the Chicago World's Fair, which opened in 1892. This book mentions Lizzie Borden twice, two times. And it doesn't, it doesn't just say that she was the alleged murderer. It condemns her of killing her father and stepmother. And I was like, oh, that's slander or libel or something. It wasn't very good. It's about the Chicago World's Fair, how it came to be, how it was built, and about a serial killer who you have probably heard of named, what's his name? He has like, he makes up, he makes up a few fake names. H.H. H. Holmes, I think. He built, it's crazy. Listen, what could pass pre-internet, pre-electronic surveillance, whatever, is insane. Like, he built like a three-story building outfitted with like gas shit, like gas tubes to gas his patients and kill them. He made someone build him a human furnace to burn bodies. He was a serial killer. Did I say that? I know I said I'm like not a true crime junkie or whatever and I would say I'm not but the only interesting parts or pretty much the only interesting parts of this book were about him. Most of the book is about the Chicago World's Fair and it is so boring and so repetitive. I get it, life is repetitive. The, I don't just mean about this. It's about the Chicago World's Fair being built. The Chicago World's Fair was like a mini city and it would talk about in detail, everything, everything. Setbacks, cost, government, petty feuds, and it was the same thing over and over again. It would be like, there was a setback, and so they worked hard. And then there was a setback, and so they worked harder. And then there was a setback that costed them money, and so they put more money in, and they were against the clock. Things I did think were interesting, this was a few years after the Paris, I don't know, World Fair exhibition, the, when the, the thing the Eiffel Tower was for. Eiffel submitted his, 
submitted a design for a tower to be built for the Chicago World's Fair, and they ended up turning it down because a bunch of American architects were like, how dare you? This is supposed to be a display of American intellectual prowess. So they denied it, and instead I was like, oh, the person they're gonna hire is gonna end up being nobody, and their building will be trash. And it was an architect named Ferris who created the Ferris wheel. And I was like, whoa, that is pretty cool. Other interesting facts, shredded wheat which I have in my kitchen right now. Shredded wheat is really good. I, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Shredded wheat is great. They're like little Triscuits, but flavorless. Shredded wheat was made for the Chicago World's Fair. Walt Disney's father worked on the Chicago World's Fair. Frank Lloyd Wright was a part of it. One of the like main, that's kind of irrelevant. Also bulbs or something were invented, popularized, incandescent. A method of lighting that in the book, they were like, and now it's in every household today. And the prank is that it's not because incandescent bulbs, the sale of them is illegal, I think. Or just that, you know, we're phased out. Like any, if you go to Target, any whatever store, they only sell LED bulbs now, which is crazy. Very boring, don't recommend it, but I, Enjoyed it for the portrait of the 1890s in Chicago. But it was, it was too much filler. Too much filler. Kind of similar to Hidden Valley Road. It takes a hook that's largely inconsequential to the actual majority of the book. In that case, schizophrenia. In this case, the Chicago World's Fair. And kind of links them up because of some tenuous link between the two for the sake of marketing. The book. The last book is, is terrible. The Lucifer Effect by Philip Zimbardo. This is about the Stanford prison experiment. It is a long 500 pages with tiny font scrunched up. No space between the lines. And it's awful. It is so bad. It is so repetitive. He says the same thing over and over and over again. In my notes, I wrote, just in, as an example, and I'm not talking about one specific part, I mean the entire thing. I stopped reading this book at like, I think it was a hundred some pages. I don't know, it's been a couple months. But he, in chapter one, I said, I swear chapter one isn't even over yet. And he said three times that the last chapter of the book is for tips and tricks to help yourself. This book needed an editor. It is making so much out of not that much. Not that much. It is, there is not that much. I've, I've tried to repress it quickly after. Poorly written, tones annoying. There's so much fluff that's just kind of there as supposedly vital context. In actuality, just fluff. There's a chapter of context about genocide. And then he's like, now I'm going to tell you about the experiment in present tense. But then he doesn't really stick to the present tense thing and it gets confusing. I also didn't, don't agree with the thesis of this book, which is that people are born good and society or their surroundings make them bad. Oh, doggy, doggy, let me finish. I think I disagree with that because I don't think it's, I disagree with that because I think it's way too naive. I don't think people are born good per se. I think be, people are born themselves and society can push you around, whatever, peer pressure, for example, whatever. But you're not born good and society is the soul responsible for making you like murderous and shit. Uh, Camille Paglia believes the opposite, that we're born bad and society is constructed to make us less animal, per se. And I more agree with that. Society's effectiveness at doing that, questionable. But we're not born like Virgin Mary-ass babies. It's way too naive. And then it's just like, listen, I'm, I'm just like Philip Zimbardo now saying that it is so repetitive. That's like meta, because now I'm being repetitive. But it is terrible. It was too much. It was repetitive. I was like, this is crazy. This is really actually crazy that this got published into a book. Malcolm Gladwell blurbs on the front, the Lucifer effect will change forever the way you think about why we behave the way we do. 
This is a disturbing book, but one that has never been more necessary. And like the concept is interesting to a point, but it can it can really be summarized in like a 10 minute YouTube video. Not this one. <laughs> Not this one. The writing is just crazy bad in this. The like analytical reasoning behind this book. It needed a serious editor. It is crazy. I can't keep saying it's bad, but it was terrible and I would never recommend this to anyone. That's it. Those are the nonfiction books that I've been reading. I have others on my docket. Who knows? Who knows what I'll read next? Have you been reading any nonfiction? Or have you been acting like the dumb doggy that you are? How about this? See you soon?